Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much to um, everyone at home for joining us. Uh, my name is Lawrence Rosenberg, and I'm the Associate Director here at the Pinsker Centre. For those of you who may not know, the Pinsker Centre is a think tank comprised of students and young professionals, and we host events centred around international politics and affairs. We specifically look at how different issues impact the Middle East, British politics, freedom of speech, uh, and other issues to broaden the discussion around these important topics. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn under the handle The Pinsker Centre. And make sure to follow us to keep up to date with all our events, podcasts, online content, and more. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our partners for this evening, uh, who are yet again, and the Bath Politics Society. Um, and before we start, I would like to quickly pass over to Joe from yet again, who would like to give a quick introduction before our talk. Jeff. Thank you, Lawrence, and thank you to all of those that are home for coming to what looks to be a fantastic event. Um, just a brief, brief background to yet again. So we are a youth-led organisation, recently established, uh, we're primarily under 25. Um, our main objective is not just to raise awareness of modern atrocity, but to understand modern atrocity, why it happens, and what can we do to prevent it? That is our core ethos. Um, at the moment, we've established our online blog, which can be found on our website, www.yetagainuk.com. And we've recently launched a podcast. Um, one of the works we do now, if any of you would like to get involved with our work, is campaign work, particularly with Stop Weaker Genocide. Um, at the moment, we're working quite heavily um, on the Genocide Amendment campaign. And we've just launched a petition video and open letter for two Holocaust survivors we are working with to meet with Boris Johnson ahead of the vote on the Genocide Amendment. So if you'd like to get involved in that campaign or our work more broadly, do get in touch. Again, our Twitter um, is at yet again UK and it's the same for Instagram or Facebook. Um, I'd like to say a massive thank you to the Pinsker Centre for hosting this evening and to Professor John Strawson for really answering some fantastic questions which um, you are about to give. Um, Lawrence, I'd like to hand back over to you before we kick off the event. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Joe. And yet again, are doing amazing work and it really is a privilege for the Pinsker Centre to be able to partner with them this evening. And uh, thank you so much for your introduction. And yeah, also really looking forward to the event. So uh, just to give everyone at home a little idea of how the event this evening will run, uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction to Professor Strawson. Um, and then Professor Strawson is going to give some remarks. And then from there, I'm going to ask a couple of questions myself, and then I will open the floor. So if you want to ask any questions, please do start thinking of them. And you can even start putting them in the question box now so that I can uh, get an eye on them to ask Professor Strawson later in the event. So without further ado, a brief introduction. Professor John Strawson is an author and law professor at the University of East London, where he teaches international law and Middle East studies. He specialises in the area of law and post-colonialism with a particular reference to the Middle East, Islam and international law. Professor Strawson is the director of the Center of Human Rights in Conflict, uh, CHRC, and was previously a visiting academic at Bizarit University. I may have said that wrong, uh, feel free to correct me on it, but it is now my pleasure to pass you over all to Professor John Strawson. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. I'd like to pass you over now. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to speak at the events of the Pinska Center. And I very much appreciate the work which you're doing. Today's topic um, is quite um, uh, apposite because uh, uh, Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, gave a very interesting uh, speech to the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, three days ago, in which he identified the main priorities of uh, human rights concern of the British government. And this is an interesting speech, a quite a short speech, but he identifies particularly four countries where he thinks there's major questions. Um, Belarus, because of the um, ongoing protests uh, against the uh, fraudulent elections. Um, Russia, uh, in particularly name-checked uh, uh, Navalny, who of course has been uh, recently re-imprisoned. Um, but also um, China, where he mentioned three questions of human rights abuses, uh, which were um, in Hong Kong, 
as a consequence of the new security law, but also uh, Tibet, which is an ongoing uh, crisis of human rights, which has been going on since 1959. And of course, uh, the plight of the Uyghurs uh, in China. Now, that was a, an interesting uh, list, if it were not that he also had, to, of course, to mention Myanmar and the fact that the uh, recent coup uh, has, of course, brought to power someone who's on the British uh, human rights sanctions list, which is uh, General Min, who is now not only the commanding of the commanding in chief of the uh, armed forces, but is also, of course, now um, has replaced the democratically elected government. Now he's on the um, human rights, uh, British human rights sanctions list, precisely because of his role in relationship to the persecution of the Rohingya Muslims. Now those four issues would be, you would think, in themselves, would constitute a human rights crisis. But if you were to add to that the ongoing civil war and war in Syria, the war in Yemen, the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the continuing uh, war um, with the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, the question of Boko Haram in um, uh, Nigeria and some neighboring states, Al-Shabaab in Somalia and uh, Kenya, and of course the fact that this year will um, mark the 20th anniversary of conflict in Afghanistan, which of course comes on the back of uh, decades of conflict in Afghanistan. So we do actually face a, a human rights um, a crisis, as, as a matter of fact. And what's it, uh, and Dominic um, Rob was quite right to say that we face an appalling human rights situation around the world. But of course, what's the challenge that he also identified was that the members of the United Nations, and indeed the members of the Human Rights Council, are often amongst those who are the abusers of human rights. And that is, of course, the great challenge that two of the states where he mentioned human rights situations are, of course, not only members of the UN, but are permanent members of the UN Security Council, uh, Russia and China. And therefore, the real question that we have to think about in terms of a strategy for the idea of human rights is how we deal with the fact that it is, it is the very members of the international community who are meant to protect human rights, who are often its violators. Now, the United Nations Charter, in its preamble, says that one of the purposes of the United Nations is to reaffirm our faith in human rights. Now, that was written in 1945, and I expect that in 1935, very few people around the world really understood anything about human rights. And don't forget, it was a time of the high point of, uh, of colonialism, uh, where most of the world's population didn't actually live in independent states, let alone have human rights. It was also a time, don't forget, where women, even in France, didn't have the right to vote. And, there, and America, of course, went into the Second World War with segregate, racially segregated armed forces. So in 1945, uh, this idea of reaffirmation of our faith in human rights was uh, high-blown rhetoric, undoubtedly, and it's taken us 75, 76 years to try and work out what we mean by that. And what the 20th century did was not only have this excellent rhetoric on the idea that, and a revolutionary idea that human beings, just because they're human beings, have human rights, not because they're citizens of a state, but because they're human beings. That's a really important idea which undermines all the ideas of state sovereignty and so on and so forth. But that's a wonderful rhetoric and we created some very important institutions, including the Human Rights Council, but also uh, regional human rights organizations such as the one in Europe, in the, in, in, in the, in the Americas, uh, in, in Africa. And of course, we ended the uh, 20th century by um, launching the international a criminal court. So we have these 20th century um, rhetoric about human rights, which is really important, and we have a lot of institutions.
But the big challenge, particularly in the 21st century, where politics has changed quite a lot, and where what we've actually seen is the rise of populism, uh, which has pitted the idea of human rights against the idea of majority rule. And that, of course, is a real question, because if you think that human rights are subject to democratic decision making by majorities, then we have to question whether or not what, what you mean by the idea of human rights, because other human rights are, exi do exist or do not. Uh, we don't really, um, in my opinion, uh, have a, 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 a we, sh we should not be negotiating those human rights. We should be thinking about the process of implementing them. Now, I'll just end these very brief remarks by saying this. I think that the real debate today about the question of, of human rights is not only the question of uh, dealing with powerful states which are abusers, it's also the way in which those countries which, and states which support the idea of human rights themselves demonstrate how they are protecting them. And there is a very big debate in Britain at the present time over this question where you have those like uh, Lord Sumption and indeed um, the, the, the Foreign Secretary, who in the past has argued that human rights is something which should be determined by parliamentary debate and discussion, by legislation, not necessarily by courts. And those, on the other hand, who say that actually, if you want the international rule of law and the rule of law, then you need courts to make these decisions. And we do have, um, we have to accept that most governments around the world have a common view at the moment, unfortunately, and uh, seeing the rule of law as somehow not only interfering with power, but interfering with democracy. And the, the, the closing thing I would say is this, human rights are often unpopular because what we say about human rights is that even people we do not like and disapprove of morally and politically have human rights. Prisoners have human rights, uh, whatever they have done, uh, including those who have committed uh, genocide have human rights in the sense that they have a right to a fair trial, for example. They have a right not to suffer cruel and inhuman punishment. And so what we're often doing with, uh, with the question of human rights is defending the idea that um, who, who, whatever you are, whatever your status, whatever your background, whatever you've done, you have human rights. And therefore, sometimes we have a, a view that, that this might be somewhat unpopular. But that's a very big debate, which I, I think we, we need to have, that in a sense that the way in which we can um, uh, aid um, the, uh, the Uyghurs uh, and, the, and the other people in human rights uh, catastrophes is, of course, by taking direct action, doing the kind of thing that the British government has done in some of these cases with putting perpetrators on lists so they can't travel to Britain, they can't invest in Britain, and so on and so forth. I think that's a really important uh, development. It's also uh, the, the United States is following a similar policy. But I also think that we have to, at the same time, show ourselves as models of protecting human rights, even when it might be politically unpopular or inconvenient. So that's just my initial remarks, and I'm sure you have lots of questions or that you might want to ask. Uh, that is amazing, uh, Professor Strawson, and thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, insightful as always. So um, now we've finished the remarks. If people want to start putting their questions, uh, if you are joining us on Zoom, if you would like to put them in the Q&A box, and if you're joining us on Facebook, please uh, put them in the Facebook comment section and we will try to get as many of those as possible. But very quickly first, um, Professor Strawson, I wanted to ask you quickly, um, a permanent feature of the UNHRC agenda is item seven on human rights situation in Palestine and other occupied Arab territories. Uh, no other country in the world is singled out for such unique treatment in the way that Israel is. Uh, what do you think of this policy and do you think it harms the international's community, uh, the international community's ability to recognize and respond to other crises across the, across the globe? Yes, I think that's a very good question. And I think that um, to some extent, uh, the situation in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory is used 
um, by many human rights uh, abusers, states who are members of the Human Rights Council, as a way of deflecting uh, attention. And I think this has now become uh, quite serious. And, I, and obviously, it's not to say that there might not be issues which the Human Rights Council might want to look at in terms of Israel and the Palestinian territories. But I think that obviously it's absurd that, um, that those questions are being um, looked at um, so obsessively uh, when major questions such as, for instance, we had the, the situation of the Rohingya Muslims. Let's face it, the Rohingya Muslims have um, suffered crimes against humanity and possibly genocide. The International Court of Justice is looking into this question. The International Criminal Court is looking into this question. The, Sy the Syrian civil war has been going on for 10 years. We have really not taken, uh, the international community has not really taken its responsibilities just to uh, Syrian civilians properly enough. So I, do, I agree, I think that there is a tendency um, to become obsessed um, with, with Israel. I think it does stem from a degree of anti-Semitism. And I also think that it is a very convenient way of deflecting attention uh, from uh, other uh, human rights abuses. And that certainly, by the way, was the, the big excuse that uh, Saddam Hussein gave uh, in the late 1970s uh, for not adopting an Arab human rights regional charter on the basis that until the Palestinians were free, you couldn't really talk about human rights anywhere. And of course, that was a very convenient um, uh, excuse for not looking at what was happening in Iraq, let alone anywhere else. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a great answer. And I'm sure lots of our viewers would be I'm super interested to hear that. Uh, my next question is on a, a quite a different topic. Um, and I wanted to look at um, sort of the World Cup in 2022. So uh, a recent report stated that more than 6,500 uh, migrant workers from India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka <clears throat> have died in Qatar since it won the right to host the World Cup 10 years ago. That means that on average, 12 workers have died a week since construction begun. And um, how have international uh, institutions been so badly corrupted to turn such a blind eye to these abuses of human rights? And what can we do as the average citizen to oppose this corruption? Well, I think it's easy to give the, it, you're absolutely right. I think international, many structures of international sport are, seem to be very corrupt. And I think we're just seeing uh, some of that actually in the reorganization of the uh, Olympic Committee in, in Tokyo at the present time, and uh, th that um, uh, uh, underlines it. And I agree about the whole of the World Cup issue. It's a very strange um, decision. Uh, it looks like it was the result possibly of bribery in the first place. And certainly the human rights abuses of non-citizens within the Gulf states uh, are a major problem. And we have to recognize that in many of these states, not just Qatar, um, uh, the majority of the population tend to be non-citizens. They're working on uh, allegedly short-term contracts. Their passports are taken away. Um, some of them are working in, um, in domestic situations where they are the victims of a whole series of different types of abuse. Um, they don't get their passport back until they've completed their um, period of work. Um, and therefore, they're really not free at all. And some of the working conditions, as you indicate, in relationship to the World Cup, the construction of the uh, facilities, uh, are, are, are appalling. Now, that's easy to analyze. It's a much more difficult question to decide. I mean, what to do? You could say there should be a boycott. Of the, uh, of the World Cup. Um, and I, I, I know for people who, who are great football supporters, this is a, a terrible sacrifice. But I think we did notice, as a matter of fact, that the sporting boycott of South Africa during the apartheid period was one of the great successes, that the uh, isolation of South Africa because of apartheid around the question of sport was a really important 
uh, intervention into the daily life of South Africans who were of all uh, ethnicities, uh, really um, a big sporting nation. And I think it did have uh, an effect. I'm not saying necessarily it was the decisive effect, that would be obviously wrong, but it was a very important uh, way of sending a message, uh, not just to the government um, of, of apartheid South Africa, but also particularly to those, to the, the white uh, population who in the main had supported it. So I think that the question of a boycott is something that we do sometimes have to think about. I mean, I'm on the whole against boycotts. I'm in favor more of engagement. Um, but I think that if you see something which is so um, appalling, and I think this is appalling, um, we, you do have to sort of consider that possibility. No, that's brilliant to hear. Um, I wanted to start opening the questions to the floor now. And our first question is from Booster Beetle, who uh, thanks you for the talk. And his question, or her question, I don't know, um, so I apologize, is my question is that with the topic of populism versus humanitarianism, what are your thoughts on the issue of tolerance and intolerance in modern politics? Uh, that, that's the question. Yes, well, I think that's a very good question. I think that um, the question of what, what, what we mean by democracy is very well brought out, actually, by um, President Erdogan of, of Turkey, uh, who is, I think, the archetype uh, populist politician long before um, Trump ever appeared on the scene, I have to say. And he explained democracy in this way. He said, democracy is like a bus. Um, when you get your, to the destination, you get off. What he really meant by that is once you've got a majority, you get off and you do what you want. And I think that's the big problem with, with populism, that the idea is that anything that the people want, that's what they, that, that's what they get. And if the people want, um, uh, don't want uh, rights for minorities, then that's what they should get. And I think that's uh, part of a, a much wider discussion in, around the question of human rights and how you approach this question of human rights. Um, so I, I think it, this is a very important question. And of course, if one look at the, the rise of populism uh, in, for instance, in Europe, in, uh, with uh, Orban in Hungary, with Kaczynski in Poland, what you've actually seen is accompanied two things. One, uh, uh, the persecution of minorities, um, uh, the rise of uh, anti-Semitism, particularly around the figure of uh, George Soros, of course, in Hungary, um, and uh, also, of course, the persecution of uh, the gay community in, in Poland, uh, and the diminished, uh, diminishing of human rights, in a sense, for the whole populations. But also we see a major attack upon the judiciary, that one of the things that have happened or the features of the rule of both of those in both of those countries has been limiting the role of the judiciary. And it seems to me that the question of the rule of law is something really very, very important. That if you don't have strong courts that are the backstop to which minorities and um, uh, or those who are seeking their rights do have a, a recourse against government power, against the majority, um, then you don't have uh, the ability to protect democracy. Because in my view, Democracy is not just a question about getting a majority, it's also respecting minorities and it's getting that balance absolutely right and that's what the rule of law is a very useful mechanism which helps us, to, uh, helps us get there. So I think this is a very good question and I think it, it, of course, it's something which in Britain is now of course also being discussed because the present uh, government want a review of uh, judicial review, which is the mechanism, those of you who are lawyers know full well, a mechanism by which the courts look at the action of public bodies, in particular the government. And there was some criticism uh, that the courts should not, for instance, have given the judgment which they gave on the prorogation case uh, just in 2019, um, when the, um, uh, the la Lady Hale uh, 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 issued a, a very important uh, a judgment which was supported by the whole of the UK Supreme Court, which said that the actions of the government in proroguing parliament 
had been unco essentially unconstitutional, unlawful. And that, of course, annoys governments um, very much because they don't like having their powers clipped. And I'm afraid to say that's the big tension that in modern politics, it seems to me, is between uh, those who think that the rule of law is important and needs to be defended, and those who think actually that the government should be able to represent uh, the majority at all costs. So I'm not saying for one minute that Boris Johnson is like Erdogan, that would be absurd. But I think that there is a, a very big debate in Britain at the present time as to what the direction for human rights should be. Fantastic. So um, as a reminder, if you've just joined us, we're being partnered with yet, uh, we've partnered this evening with yet again. Um, and our next question is from Kirsty Robson, the co-executive director of yet again. Uh, her question is, what action would you like to see the British government take in response to the ongoing atrocities, particularly persecution of the Uyghur Muslims? Well, Kirsty, first of all, uh, I'd like to say I'm very impressed with the work of, of yet again, and I, I hope it, um, uh, it, I think it's a very important initiative and I, I wish it all a success. I think the first, there's, there's really three levels of this. And I have to say, uh, I do think that um, one of the big things is it, we have to make a very big decision on uh, economic uh, relations uh, with China. And I know this is very difficult because this is, we're in the middle of a, well, in, the, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, we have an economic and financial crisis. Uh, uh, people's jobs depend upon our international trading relations. We've just left the European Union, and therefore the question of trading relations is perhaps more important than it would have been otherwise. And of course, relations with China, uh, given its uh, huge capacity in the international economy, uh, are, are very important. But I do think we have to review this. And I think that uh, looking at even Dominic Raab mentioned this uh, at the Human Rights Council. We have to look at supply chains. Uh, we have to accept that a lot of the things that we buy and use, uh, I'm speaking on a, um, an Apple computer, which is uh, definitely made in China. Uh, my phone is made in China in the same way. Um, so when we're talking about economic relations, we are talking about our, inter our, our intimate, the way in which we organize our lives. Uh, but I do think we need to think very carefully about the kind of trading and economic relationships that we have. Secondly, I do think that we need to use our legislation that we have adopted in, in 2018 uh, in imposing um, uh, sanctions uh, on individuals and organizations who are known or we think are engaged in massive human rights abuses. And that I think is something that we do need to say uh, does have to be uh, applied to people in China as well who are engaged in the uh, activities. And we know the activities are enormously serious. We're talking about effectively uh, concentration camps, which are dressed up as re-education centers. We're talking about forced sterilization. We're talking about displacement and, and discrimination and human rights abuses on such a massive scale that really we should not be putting up with it. And we need to identify those uh, organizations and individuals uh, who are primarily uh, involved in it and put them on, on this list. And th uh, thirdly, I do think, and this is what I think about one of the problems we've got into with the human rights movement, is that we thought of human rights, I and mean, we did this very early in the 1950s, perhaps too quickly, as just as a legal question. And uh, we rushed into a legalization of it, I think. I'm not against it, but I think we rushed into it without doing something else, which is creating a politics of human rights. And that's what's so important about human rights NGOs, is because, and like yet again, is that what uh, human rights NGOs, grassroots NGOs do, is to promote an emancipatory view of human rights, that human rights is not just the responsibility of governments, but it's the responsibility of citizens. And the more active citizenry that we have, the more education we have on human rights and human rights abuses, the more likely it is that we'll be able to um, create uh, the kind of political pressure that we need. And I think that the question of a politics of human rights uh, and developing that uh, in the community is very important. And I'll say one other thing in relation to that. One thing which saddens me is that some 
human rights organizations uh, uh, such as uh, Amnesty International, who have in the past played a very important role in raising precisely this kind of grassroots issues, have somewhat lost their way. We saw, I think, yesterday or the day before that they dropped Navalny as being a prisoner of conscience um, for, for uh, reasons which I think are, are, are spurious. He was a, by the way, he was a Russian nationalist. He had some very pleasant idea, unpleasant ideas, but he has changed a, a great deal, as often people do, and has dropped those views. And they're using that against him. And I think that's ridiculous. And I think some of the things they've said about uh, Israel and the Palestinian territories are also um, uh, absurd. And they produced a, a ridiculous report, in my view, um, on uh, the way in which uh, ISIS was defeated in Raqqa, um, which quite frankly would have meant that, that if you followed what Amnesty International said about Raqqa, uh, Hitler would still be, or his successors would still be running Berlin. Um, uh, it's quite extraordinary. So I think we have to be clear that some of these organizations unfortunately have lost their way and it's very important I think now to develop more grassroots organizations of the kind which uh, Kirst is, uh, is, is leading. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree with your remarks more and it's, uh, it's great to hear. Um, sort of a follow-up question on the same topic is from Ben Hayton, who asked the question on Facebook. Uh, he asked, what can liberal democracies feasibly do to stand up to human, right abuse, human rights abusers um, who are powerful, as you say, um, such as Russia and China? First of all, Ben, I think you have to say this, that, human, that defending human rights is a long-term project. It's not something that we're going to do immediately, necessarily. Sometimes we will have successes, quick successes. Um, but sometimes we're going to have to take a, a long view. And I, I, I take I, my, uh, my experience of that was a, 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 as a long term activist against apartheid in South Africa, uh, which seemed at some times uh, so long and so impossible that um, you just thought it's never going to end. And um, but, the, but the important point is that the, the, the the constant campaigning and activism, encouraging people to take small steps, in that case was also encouraging people not to buy um, South African uh, produce in shops, um, not to bank with Barclays Bank, in my case, taking my overdraft away from it. I don't think that necessarily had a big effect, but nonetheless, those small things, it's, make, it's getting people involved in the long term and, and uh, that, they, that they really do need to, um, to be committed and to, and to and you have to give people a way, a practical way in which they can feel uh, involved and empowered. And I think that's something which is, is very crucial, critical. The other thing I think that liberal democracies have to do is, as I said before, I think liberal democracies need to be a showcase for the protection of human rights. And I think, you know, in Britain, uh, we having a, a lot, we had a long debate about, for instance, the European Court of Human Rights saying that prisoners should have the right to vote. I know lots of people don't like that idea, but the European Court takes a view that if you're sent to prison, that's your sentence. You're not sentenced to being deprived of your citizens' rights. Um, and the British government has been asked um, repeatedly uh, to change uh, its legislation. And governments of both parties, uh, um, and indeed all parties, all major parties, because the Liberal Democrats and the Tories refused to do it, and the Labour government refused to do it, um, have resisted it. Now, I think, I, I, do, I do accept, of course, this is a controversial question, though in most countries in the world, including, by the way, Israel, prisoners do actually have the right to vote. Um, and if you want to take away people's uh, civil rights as an extra punishment, then it seems to me you need to put that on uh, the statute book. So it's, sometimes human rights are very inconvenient. And I do think that governments... Uh, should, in liberal democracies, if they really want to lecture, uh, and they should be, uh, those who are carrying out egregious human rights abuses, we need to really be the showcase of, of showing how human rights um, works, even when it's inconvenient. Absolutely. Actually, we have a question that was asked a little bit ago, and I'm going to sort of go back to that because it's sort of on the same topic. And it's from an anonymous attendee who asks, is it hypocrisy for the current British government 
to outline a human rights focused foreign policy while domestically seeking to uh, derogate or entirely scrap the Human Rights Act. And they then go with a follow up which says, is the Human Rights Act under threat and do the courts have any ability to protect it from legislative attacks? Yes, I think this is a really important question, Britain. And uh, Lord Sumption, in his Reef Lectures uh, a couple of years ago, um, was one of the voices which was uh, a a attacking the idea that courts should make the final decisions on questions of human rights. And he argued this in uh, the, the Reef Lectures took place also in the United States. Um, and he was arguing against the United States um, uh, system because the United States Constitution, which ironically was originally based on what the revolutionaries thought the British Constitution was organized, uh, minus an absolute monarchy, um, didn't, of course, have a provision for judicial review. And it was only decided uh, in, in the case of Marbury Madison uh, about um, uh, 40 years after the constitution came into force, that the courts, that if you had the rule of law, that th that must mean that the courts must make the final decision. Now, I'm very much in that mold. I do think that courts are the best place uh, to make these decisions. And I, one of the, the cases, the situation, for instance, which um, Lord Sumption took, he said, look, um, the American Supreme Court uh, recognized the right of equal marriage, um, gay marriage, essentially. And um, therefore, isn't, wouldn't it be much better if the Congress had passed legislation? And I think that's a very interesting point because that raises precisely this question of whether a popular majority, whatever that popular majority might be, to determine our human rights, or whether human rights should be something which transcend those uh, popular majorities, which by the way, are by their nature, transient and change as we know. Um, so I do think that, um, that this discussion about the Human Rights Act is important. What's going to happen? I don't know. I, there is a review of it. There's been a review, actually a, s a slow review going on, on the question of the Human Rights Act. What is the Human Rights Act? The Human Rights Act is the repatriation to British law of the European Convention on Human Rights. What they and I know um, Dominic Raab doesn't like this either. What they don't like is the way in which the courts, by interpreting the Human Rights Act, sometimes they think extend or stretch human rights. But that's all courts always interpret all legislation, including the Human Rights Act, and are bound as a consequence to extend our understanding of rights. And this is something which is not alien uh, to the English common law system. If you think, for instance, on women's rights, one of the most important developments uh, in marriage and divorce was what became known as married women's equity, in which Lord Denning, the master of the roles, said that um, women who did not work um, but had been looking after the home in a situation of a divorce and financial settlement actually had rights. Uh, two, he gave it at least a third, it now of course would be 50-50, but the idea of married women's equity was introduced by the common law, not by legislation and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, it's perfectly within the, the, the English common law tradition that we develop uh, ideas uh, of how we uh, interpret and apply law through the courts, that's perfectly normal, and I don't think it's really alien. Yes, there is a big issue, and I think um, part of um, the, the next few years, I don't know how quickly the, those two pieces of review taking place, one on the Human Rights Act, one on Judicial Review, how quickly or what conclusions uh, these reviews will come to. But in my view, it is really very important, I think, to defend the idea of the Human Rights Act and uh, of Judicial Review. I think that's part of liberal democracy. Well, it was brilliant in there that you, you mentioned the United States, because our next question is from Charlie Woods, who has mentioned about the United States and with an incoming, well, a new president, um, asks, will President Biden improve international organizations' ability to tackle international human rights violations? Well, I think that's the, uh, the, the big um, uh, 
speech, which on, on foreign affairs, international relations, uh, Biden makes, has made regularly, he's only been in office for a short time. He keeps talking about America getting back uh, into international uh, relations, and America is back. And part of that does seem to be a commitment around the question of human rights. And I think that is an important development. And I think the, um, the Secretary of State, uh, Blilkin, and, the, um, and Jack Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, are very much uh, advocates of that. And I think we're going to see uh, a, a quite a big difference in the attitude of, of human rights. I and mean, it's very interesting that um, you know, to hear the American Secretary of State um, in talking to uh, his um, Israeli opposite number um, calling for uh, the Israelis to uh, assist in the vaccination of the Palestinians in the occupied territories, for instance, which I think is a very important question. By the way, I think it's, um, it, it's legally important, it's legal obligation, but I also think it's, um, from every practical point of view, it's absolutely essential for uh, the protection of um, Israeli, Israeli, Israeli health system. But um, I think we are going to see a big difference, and I think that is going to, have, going to be very critical in the Middle East. I think there'll be a renegotiation of the relationships with um, Saudi Arabia. I think uh, the um, Trump administration was far too sanguine about what was taking place, uh, not over just the Khashoggi um, murder, but also uh, what was happening to particularly women uh, in the, the very brief, slight liberalization was taking place. Where large numbers of women activists have been in prison. It's very important to put pressure on them. Don't forget, the United States and Saudi Arabia are very long-term allies. The United States and Saudi Arabia had a relationship uh, going right back to the 1920s. And I think that uh, they do have uh, the ability to, to influence. <laughs> so I think there are big questions. One issue I, I, I do think is, which is uh, very related to anyone interested in the Middle East, <laughs> was of course the Trump administration's uh, last act, one of the last acts in persuading uh, Morocco uh, to normalize relationships with Israel, was of course to recognize Moroccan sovereignty over the Western Sahara. Now the Western Sahara <laughs> has been recognized by the international community and by the International Court of Justice since 1975, so not a new thing. Um, I think Dominic Raab would have been one when this decision was made, um, just to give you an idea of how long this has been going on. The International Court of Justice recognized that the people of the Western Sahara had a right of, to self-determination and there should be a referendum to determine how they wanted to exercise that right. Did they want to join Morocco? That would be fine if they wanted to. <coughs> or did they want to form an independent state? No referendum has taken place. And I'm, I'm hoping that the, and one of this would be a very important touchstone, it seems to me, of, of human rights um, attitudes by the Biden administration is how they deal with that uh, commitment which the Trump administration made over the Western Sahara. So I think there's big challenges. I, I think there's a, certainly a, a big change of atmosphere and I know the United States want to regain uh, their position in the United uh, Nations Human Rights Council precisely to fight against um, the, the, the obvious bias against uh, Israel and also to promote uh, a wider human rights agenda. Just to sort of pivot back more towards the UK, uh, an anonymous attendee has asked, do you have any views on the genocide amendment that's been in the Commons lately and is due to return soon after the Conservatives made repeat attempts uh, to stop it from passing. Do you think it would be, uh, do you think it would be allowed, that might be a small typo, um, do you think it would be allowed, oh, do you think it would allow the UK to become an international leader on domestic genocide determination? Yeah, I think it's very important. I, I, I think it's a very important amendment and I, I and I, I noticed that the House of Lords reinstated the amendment with even a bigger majority than the first time. And I think with, with massive cross-party support, and I think that's something which the government needs to take into account. And I think that's, I agree with the, the, the tenor of the question. I think that if, if you want to really um, talk about human rights and promote human rights, you need to take the question seriously. And this is the most serious issue, I think. 
<laughs> and all it's really saying is, if a British court were to determine that a situation in a particular, in a particular country uh, was genocide, and let's be quite clear, um, the definition of genocide is, very, uh, is a very high bar uh, in order to reach uh, that determination. Uh, the, the Genocide Convention Act, which is essentially incorporated into the International uh, Criminal uh, Court Statute, which is, by the way, also part of English law, basically says that genocide uh, is committed if the perpetrator has the intent to destroy uh, a human group uh, defined as, uh, as national, uh, ethnic, racial, or religious. So you have to have the intention to destroy, not just the intention to kill or even just the, the, the intention to exterminate a group of people. You have to really have the intention to destroy in whole or in part a, a human, one of the, the protected human groups. <coughs> so this is not something which is lightly decided. And we've had um, very few cases on genocide in the international uh, courts and tribunals we've had. We've had um, uh, findings of genocide in the Rwanda um, uh, in, uh, United Nations International Criminal Tribunal and also in the International Criminal Tribunal uh, for Yugoslavia. And what's interesting is how carefully uh, the judges in those courts have looked at this question of genocide. So it's not a question, it's not a like-minded thing. And I think that if courts were to look into situations and to apply those very high standards, <laughs> I think it would be a really uh, uh, important development. And I, I think that the, the time really is now to press uh, for the adoption of this amendment and to, and to really shame uh, those MPs who really think that against the background of what's happened to the Rohingya Muslims, against the background of what's taking place uh, to the, for the Uyghur people, that this really is surely the time uh, to say uh, we, that never again uh, does actually need to mean something. And that does, and I think this is a very simple and uh, effective mechanism which would uh, add something to our human rights armory. I think you make an important statement there about never again. We hosted an event with the, the Pinsker Centre hosted an event earlier this month with a Holocaust survivor, Elizabeth Mann. And I think the message of never again is still something that rings very true. Um, I'm Jewish myself, so, you know, it's a very personal affiliation to that message. So I think you make a really important point. I am going to combine the next two questions um, because they're somewhat on the same subjects with the first question coming from an anonymous attendee and the second from Kat Woolley. Um, I'm going to ask them both because I'm, I can't combine them on the spot. I'm not good enough to do that, unfortunately. Um, what does the professor think about the Polish government's controversial opposition to its own judiciary and EU courts? And the second was, as we witness uh, the consolidation of authoritarian power in Poland and Hungary, who has responsibility in the immediacy to respond? Is it the EU, UN or individuals? Well, I take the, f the, the last question first. I mean, I think this is a really difficult question, but I think it's one which the European Union needs to deal with. Um, when the Austrian, when Austria created a government with the Austrian Freedom Party, um, a coalition, it was the minority at the time, uh, the EU um, did actually institute um, a way of boycotting the Austrian government. And I think that was a very important message. And what I have to say is what's quite problematic is that we've had no similar uh, actions from the EU over uh, uh, Hungary and Poland. And I do think it's the EU which needs to take uh, uh, the measures. Don't forget the EU <clears throat> has incorporated the European Convention of Human Rights into U EU legislation. I think on the question of the judiciary, on fair trials, um, uh, on minority rights, um, I think that both countries are, are very um, uh, uh, are, are falling below the requirements and the standards that you would expect. So I think the EU needs to take some tough measures. And I have to say, I, I, I'm straying into something else. I, I, I feel sorry that Britain isn't in the EU to actually take the lead 
on those kind of questions because I think it does need um, uh, the, the more powerful um, countries in the European Union, in this case, the, 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 the key countries, of course, are Germany and France, uh, to really to take these kind of measures. But I can see it. The European Union is a delicate position, particularly just after Brexit. I can see um, there, are, there would be concerns, but I, I think it is their obligation to do it. And I think the, on the question of the, the attacks on the Polish judiciary, I think it is absolutely um, uh, a, a, a really worrying trend. And I think the trouble is we, we have had um, attacks on the judiciary uh, across the Western world. I mean, it's not just in Poland. I think that's something we have to say. We saw the United States, uh, Trump uh, thought that by appointing judges, um, uh, they would do his bidding. And I think it has been a very big shock to him uh, that none of the judges he appointed um, during his period of office, not just Supreme Court judges, but also other federal court judges, took his view on, the, uh, on his uh, uh, fantasy about the so-called uh, uh, corrupt election practices um, and the election fraud. And I think he was very shocked by that. And that kind of shows us in my opinion, how very important courts are uh, as this uh, uh, defender of the question of human rights. And in, in Poland uh, and in uh, Hungary, of course, there's been this attempt to, to weaken uh, the, the judiciary uh, itself and to make the appointments more critical. Um, we'll see, of course, and I, I don't know how this will pan out in the long term, but we've also seen the similar attacks in Britain. Don't forget, we've had headlines in British newspapers about judges being the enemies of the people uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I think that was when uh, the Supreme Court said that the <clears throat> needed to be a vote in Parliament on the legislation um, for Brexit, as opposed to um, the, the, the use of the royal prerogative, the, effective decree powers that the British government has in relationship particularly to foreign affairs and defense. Um, and we saw those, those headlines, enemies of the people. So we have to accept that, yes, the Poland is a really serious issue, um, but we have seen some of this uh, in other parts of the world too. And I think that's something we have to take very seriously and we do need to, to combat. Thank you, for Pro Professor Strawson. And I'm going to move on to our last question now before we have to conclude. Uh, thank you to everyone at home who's asked questions. And I am deeply sorry if we, aren't, we haven't been able to reach yours this evening, but we do have more events coming up. So please do like us our, across our social media platforms to keep up to date and be able to ask lots of great questions at our following events. And my last question is again from an anonymous attendee who asks, what is your opinion on the so-called big tech debate in social media and the need to balance the responsibility of big platforms like Facebook and Twitter to censor hate speech and threatening content with legal human rights uh, to freedom of speech under the US Constitution and the European Convention of Human Rights. I'd just like to add as well very quickly, we, we've seen this sort of uh, debate erupt, um, especially in Australia, where you have um, the Prime Minister there saying they're not going to be uh, deterred or, or changed policy by big tech. And I think a lot of people are worried. I think they're worried that big tech is going to start writing laws as, you know, money is power in a lot of these countries. And I think the worry is, is that as these, these big tech companies uh, grow in money and in power and in influence as well, for sure, that they're going to start dictating things rather than the people. So what is your opinion on that question? And, and especially on the debate as well. I think there's two quite, two quite separate questions. One is what Australia did, which Australia stood up to Facebook and basically said, uh, we, we want you to compensate our news media for your, if you want to use the platform in Australia, our news media is suffering and we need to be compensated um, for the fact that uh, you're giving free news coverage uh, and it's undermining Australia's uh, media. And that I think is one thing about the general freedom of expression, the, the, which I think is an important issue. And it's what's interesting is that the Australians stood up to them and the, there was a, a small moment in which there was a withdrawal of Facebook services. And then very quickly, there's been a negotiated agreement. And I'm sure that uh, European countries uh, are gonna look at 
this very, very closely. Britain will take a look at that experience very closely and, and think again about it. <coughs> and this is the, the, that's, that's one of the problems about the drowning out of um, pluralist voices within the media. And though we have this wonderful um, access to media today, we, what, what is the, the concern is who's controlling the media, which is a very big issue. It seems to be in the hands of a relatively small number of people or organizations, I should say. And then, of course, the other side of the question is about abuse, uh, online abuse. And I have to say there is a huge amount of online abuse. And we've seen it, of course, in, in Britain in relationship to um, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Uh, we've seen it in relationship, we're seeing it in relationship at the present time to what's happening to Bristol University students. Um, where I think uh, what's worrying is that you have these terrible pylons to people, um, terrible um, levels of uh, abuse, which obviously can have terrible effects on people's mental health and um, are, un are really undesirable. So the question is how we um, uh, square the question of <clears throat> free speech uh, with the banning of, of hate speech. And this is an old question. I mean, it's a new technology, but it's an absolutely old question. And that is a very, where do you draw the line? And this is always very difficult. <clears throat> um, it's a difficult question where you draw the line. And I think that um, what we do need to do is just to extend to social platform, to set the, the, the social platforms, the same requirements that we have in ordinary law. And that I think, you know, this is what we need to do. We need to be able to police these things in exactly the same way. Whether you make a statement in, a, in, in, a, in an article, <coughs> whether you make a statement on television, whether you make a statement on uh, Facebook or Instagram uh, or, or, or Twitter, it seems to me that they should be treated in exactly the same way. And what you've got into a, a kind of um, moment when we allowed, I think, a little, a, a huge slippage <coughs> in, terms of the, in terms of public discourse. And I think this is, goes right to the heart of the whole question of what we mean by liberal democracy. Unless we have uh, civil discussions, we can't really have freedom of speech. We need civil discussions. And that the way in which, um, and I think one sees this really, in, in, it's a terrible example, uh, <coughs> what's happening to Bristol uh, uh, Jewish students at the present time, is that the way in which uh, they have been, uh, are being viciously uh, portrayed, uh, erroneously related to conspiracy theories and so on and so forth. And this is preventing their freedom of speech. And I was very struck yesterday at the rally, in so the virtual rally in support of them, by the president of the Jewish society, reading out an account of a student being in a class, feeling unable to um, uh, stand up to, for instance, Professor David Miller. And I think that the question of freedom of speech is not the freedom to be, to insult, to intimidate, but it is the freedom to be empowered to express your opinion. And I think that's what we uh, need to make sure that the social media platforms are properly regulated so that they allow that to take place. <coughs> that's a brilliant answer. And I think there's a lot of people who will be watching this evening who have been troubled by what they've seen going on in Bristol. So I appreciate you passing on that. And unfortunately, I do think that is all we're going to have time for this evening. Um, thank you, Professor Strawson, uh, for the talk this evening. It's been a true honor for myself but also for the Pinsker Centre and our partners, uh, yet again, and the Bath Politics Society, who I want to also quickly say thank you to again for their support this evening. Uh, but also, again, thank you to you for your insightful remarks. And thank you as well to all of you at home who've taken the time to join us this evening for this important webinar. If you've enjoyed this event, please make sure to like us on all our social media outlets to make sure you can keep up to date with everything that we're doing. So thank you again from me and good night to everyone. Um, and yeah, it's brilliant. And thank you again, Professor Strawson for joining us.